and we uh, had good sports programs. You know, I played basketball on that team for you know fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. We played other Lutheran schools all over the Los Angeles areas, and we I think in the four years we probably lost four games. You know, it was just every year we got our names on some trophy, and all those little seventh and eighth graders were so proud of those trophies. But it was a great experience just growing up and being home in that place. And so we, we did learn a lot of Bible, memory verses, stuff, and took it for granted for the most part. I remember when we got into catechism class, I was telling some of the guys today, you know, that the pastor there was just a, a really large Lutheran church there in the city of Orange, California. He was just a, not a nice guy. And he, he had to come and teach us catechism, and he knew about half of us were in there just to goof off, you know, and that just made him all the more mad. And, uh, but, you know, early on in 7th and 8th grade, I got into stuff with some of the guys that weren't good stuff. You know, we would we could buy cigarettes at the 76 station for a quarter and a uh, little vending machine, you know, pull a handle on it. And when the guy there that worked there wasn't looking, we would, we would go and get our pack of cigarettes, you know. And I remember one time we'd come back from the beach and my, and my mom had borrowed my jacket and she said, well, who smokes Terryton? Terry Jim, for you younger folks, don't know, that's an old brand of cigarettes that went out in public 50 years ago. But, uh, you know, and so but that was just kind of stuff we got into, you know, and then I, 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 we had a good sports program and everything, but all my other buddies from Little League and, you know, youth sports in the area, they were going to public schools. So when I got to the ninth grade, I already pretty much knew, you know, a lot of the game because I lived in one neighborhood all those times. And then... You know, was involved with football and baseball and basketball and stuff. But, you know, we, we got into drinking a little bit on in the ninth grade. And then as we moved into high school, uh, started driving and stuff. I never did, never really did drugs, but, but drinking was just a part of our lifestyle down there in Orange County in those days. And, and I, I don't know if that's for, you know, I mean, I've been out of high school you know, in another three years, it'll be 50 years. And I don't know if it was like that for all you guys that went around here. I know I talked to Vern. I don't think Vern did a lot of drinking in high school like, like we did. But there was a party every Friday and Saturday night. So we were drunk every Friday and Saturday night. We'd buy a, a six-pack of Colt 45 because that was cool. And uh, try to kill ourselves. I can still remember being at parties, and, you know, handing over a toilet. toilet you know, making room for the next beer, thinking, is this is this fun, you know? And uh, uh, never never drank to where I got sick, but we just did a lot of drinking. That's that was the deal. And I remember in high school, one of the one of the Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith Calvary Chapel, was right down the road. And a couple of the girls, you know, that used to hang out in the big group that we hung out in, uh, she said, uh, a couple of them said, "Hey, we're going down to Calvary." I didn't know what Calvary was, but you want to go? I said, sure, I'll go. So we went down to Calvary, and this was, if you go to Calvary today, they have a big sanctuary, and there's a bookstore next door. Well, in those days, the bookstore that is today was the main chapel. That was Calvary Chapel. And so I'll never forget walking in there on a Tuesday or Wednesday night. It was probably 15 minutes for us to drive over there. And, uh, you know, in a building not much bigger than this, in the center aisle, Use on both sides, jam packed, long haired hippie dudes everywhere, and just I mean older than us, you know, in their twenties, just really, you know, it seemed like they were all whacked out, you know, they're just just a bunch of genuine hippies, whatever that is. And um, but Chuck Smith preached, and uh, and it was mesmerizing. I mean, he was a gifted speaker, and. Um, it was, just, it was fun to be a part of that. I think I went probably just two times. But that girl, one of the girls, she asked me, you know, Doug, if you were to die today, do you know where you would spend eternity? And, of course, I was raised in a Lutheran church. I knew the Bible fairly well. And I said, yeah, probably probably not good. You know, it's probably not the answer you're looking for. And, uh, and so she, but she was influ influential to me just because she asked the question. It got me thinking. And so I went to, and she hung out with this huge group that we hung out with. And uh, so I remember going to one Bible study with her and some other folks. And it just wasn't me. It, it just, it had nothing attracted to me. It was just 
I don't know, people I didn't know, too intimate, you know, it was just didn't feel right. So that was the only time I did anything like that. But in high school, when I was a junior, um, I met, uh, of course, Margo came up, and a lot of us juniors were hanging out with uh, sophomore girls and guys, too. I mean, for that, it was, like I say, it was just this huge crowd, because we'd all go to the beach together. You know, you, in those days, you could hitchhike to the beach, and a car would come by full of orange high school kids, and you'd all just jump in, you know? And uh, so, you know, but I, I had my eye on Margo, and her so-called best friend, I said, now, who's that? And she says, oh, that's Margo, but you won't like her, Doug, because her parents don't let her go to dances, and she doesn't drink, and, you know, she's just not you. And I, I go, well, maybe... Maybe I would like her, you know? And, uh, uh, of course, this is the girl I've been married to for 45 years now. And uh, but it was just interesting. We later, of course, would laugh about that, uh, how her girl girlfriend would try to steer me some other direction. Uh, but, you know, in, in my life, like I say, growing up through that Lutheran High, we had, I had so much freedom. I mean, we just rode our bikes all over Orange County, literally, from all the way out to Irvine Park, which is 15 miles the beach, probably 15 miles or 18 miles, and that freedom was good. I think it developed my soul and my spirit, but it was also bad because I had too much freedom. I got into stuff I should have never got involved with. I mean, we, you know, like we were always stealing things from the store, and I worked from the time I was 12 years old. When I was 12 years old, I got paid six bucks a day, six dollars a day for six days a week from my dad. I made 36 dollars, and no tax taken out. But I had a lot, in those days, that was a lot of money. And uh, so I didn't have any reason to be stealing, but we'd steal candy on the way to school. And it just it just was uh, a lifestyle. I remember one time at St. John's, we, were having, we always had these basketball tournaments. And while the other team was up playing, me and our buddies are down in the locker room. They didn't have lockers. Their pants were just hanging on hooks. So we're down there going through all their pants, taking their money. You know, it, it's just like, who does that? I look back at it now, and it, I just, it just seems unconscionable that that's the behavior that was a part of my life. And, uh, but again, all that freedom, you know, there's a, there's a positive, but there's also a negative to it. And, uh, and I remember another time there was this little Episcopal chapel. Now it was part of the Chapman University Chapel down there. Now it's about two blocks from the main campus of Chapman. And Chapman University it just has gobbled up all that part of Orange, the city of Orange down by the plaza. And in those days, that was an Episcopal chapel. And we would just, we lived on our bicycles. We had 10 speed bikes, you know, we had handlebars turned up so we popped wheelies. We could wheelie for a two block stretch, you know. And, but I, re, I can still remember going into that Episcopal chapel and they had a little oak box, really ornate, and it had a, they had an altar rail on both sides of this little oak box. And it was for offerings. But we'd go in there and still the offering out of the church, and then we'd go down to the gas station and buy cigarettes or go to the mall store. You could buy you could buy malts for 25 or 30 cents at Rexall Drugstore. And, uh, you know, it was just like all the, all this craziness that I that had just become me. And, the, and, like, the teachers must have known that something wasn't, you know, that we weren't just a bunch of little angels. There was about eight or ten of us, you know. And, uh, and yet, you know, my dad was just gone all the time. He was just busy building a business, you know. And it was uh, just a small little concrete plant in those days with about a dozen workers. But it took everything he had to scrape enough money together to do house payments and everything else. So, but that was the lifestyle that I got into. And then I remember uh, after I got out of high school, the first year, you, me and my buddy John, we were going to be in the landscape business. So we moved to Phoenix, Arizona, where my grandmother lived, to be landscapers. Of course, nobody has grass over there. It's all rocks, you know. But we, we had a hard time getting, we had a lot more, but no, no grass to cut. <laughs> that lasted about a month. And then we knew two girls that were up in Salt Lake City, and they were a year older than uh, we were, but one of them had been my buddy John's uh, brother's girlfriend. So we went out and bought all new skis, boots, poles, bindings, and we drove to Salt Lake. This is like six months after high school. And we were up there. And we met, these two girls had a couple guys they were hanging out with, and they were not the best guys. And, and so we, I remember one day we went hunting without licenses out in the west part of Salt Lake, out in the valley there. And we came back, and we were, we 
Don't ask me why. I mean, none of this makes any sense. But we, we went and uh, we were going to steal some steaks to barbecue from Safeway. So we all had ski clothes on, parkas, and, you know, zipped up. Uh, you know, so you, you, went, you look like Pillsbury Doughboy. And so when we left that butcher department, the meat department, we had, we had all the butcher's steaks in our clothes. And we bought like a loaf of bread or something, and we left. And I remember looking at the back, and I remember seeing this butcher looking at his meat department and looking up. And my buddy John was in the other checkout station with this guy that he didn't know, and I didn't know the guy who was with me, and we were just buying something. I mean, it just makes no sense. But that's, but that's one of those days, I don't know if you, you guys ever remember the Harold Morris story, remember that he stole a pack of cigarettes and spent the next 20 years in jail and was accused of murder and all this stuff. It, it, that, that could have been my day that things really turned south. And uh, so I, I gave the guy with me 20 bucks and I said, pay for this bread, we got to get out of here, we're about to get busted. And I went over and whispered that to John. I went out and I had a 1956 Ford pickup truck. Cherry red, you know, and I bought it from my buddy. And uh, so we went out in the back. I just started the truck up, started leaving the parking lot. My buddy John jumped, jumped in the back, buried his stakes in the snow. And then as we're leaving, the other two guys, one runs out the front door with a guy hanging on him, and the other guy runs out the side door with a butcher hanging on to him. And uh, they get loose. They see us, realize we're all together, of course, and try to get our license plate, but John was hanging up back with his uh, jacket over the license plate. <laughs> and, uh, and that is the last day I ever stole anything. I realized, like, this is a bad thing. Now, three or four months later, I had, I had uh, I dated Margo a little bit. I'm one year older than Margo, and, and I had dated Margo a little bit through that summer that I got out of high school for about the next four months or so, four or five months. And then I, then John and I moved to Arizona. And then from there, he went up to Salt Lake City and that's where we had this thing at the Safeway store. And, um, but I, she had exposed me to church and I had always appreciated her family and what I had seen in her. She was the one person in that large high school crowd that was, a, was having a good time, but uncompromising. And, I mean, everybody knew that that family was, were straight arrows. And um, now, luckily, through all that drinking and partying that I did, I never fooled around with girls, and I never, I never became um, impure or anything like that. So God was protecting me, which, which is a miracle in and of itself. And I always say later, you know, that I think I was so drunk most Friday and Saturday nights that, you know, I, I was passed out on the bed, you know, and the girls probably wondering what what are we doing here, you know, but, <laughs> but God just protected me, and uh, so then as the, uh, you know, I, we came back from Utah, and then I started hanging around Margo a little bit through January, February, and then she, during the Easter break, she asked me, she said, hey, what are you doing? Um, there's a, something going on at my cousin's church, which is a, was an assembly God, a God, assembly God church, right? You know, three blocks from her church. And her cousin's all went there. It was a big assembly of God church. A fantastic preacher. Really a, a great church on fire for God. And I went over to her house, you know, that night. And she said, come on, we're all going over there to this musical. And I said, well, I don't really want to go. Because I was still drinking and I wasn't living right. But I really did like Margo. And we had made a lot of progress, you know, kind of on and off, but now getting back together. I said, well, I'll go with John, I'll go. I knew John wouldn't go, you know. So I called John, and I, you know, no cell phones. Phone was on the wall, I remember dialing the number, and, and uh, John says, probably said, hell no, I'm not going. That's probably what he said, but he said, there's no way I'm going, but you're on your own. So I said, okay. And uh, so I said, well, John's not going, and long story short, they talked me into it. So I go to I go to the the musical. It was a Chris. It was an Easter musical, and it was No Greater Love, and um, written by John W. Peterson, and it was just um, just some phenomenal music. But most importantly, it was, it was it was a drama, and they portrayed the Easter story. And I'll never forget as long as I live. Uh, they had this thin veil like a cable on a radius, and they had 
they had a thin veil that you could see through it, and behind that veil they had a cross, and somebody portraying Jesus on the cross. And, um, I mean, it really got to me. And, I mean, it was clear as a bell that he was taking my place. And so we were probably sitting in the third or fourth row from the front. And so the pastor very effectively said at the end of that, said, you know, what, what about you? You know, do you have any room in your heart for Jesus? And are you living right? And would you consider uh, a change of trajectory and, and just yielding and giving your life to Christ? And I'm telling you, I know my hand was the first one in there that was shot up. He said, if you want to accept Jesus, would you just slip your hand up and we'll get somebody to we'll pray with you and it could be the beginning of a new, a new way of life. So I knew I clearly wasn't living right. And, um, and I knew right from wrong. The stealing stuff, I, to this day, I can't figure it out. It's just, I think it just becomes a behavior that's, you know, that's just almost unexplainable. Especially because I always had money. I worked all the way through junior high and high school. I always had a ton of money. I had enough money for cars because I worked a lot. And uh, so I can't explain the stealing thing. But beyond that, I just, I knew I wasn't living right with the drinking and such. So, so anyway, that was, um, that was the day, that was the evening that, you know, I gave my heart to, to Christ. And as I've often said, you know, I never, ever would have realized the impact, you know, as a, as a, I wasn't even 19 years old yet. I was 18 and three quarters of a year. Old. I'm born in July, and this was probably the first or tenth or something like that. But how could an 18 year old really know the the impact of such a decision? You know that how that would affect my marriage all the way through, my four children who all love God and and serve Jesus to this day, and uh, and where would I've been without Jesus? Where would I have ended up? My trajectory was in self-destruction mode. And I think it's just a good experience, a good practice to go back and, and you know, I know some of your stories that are in here. And, uh, you know, Gail, I you know you so well, but, you know, there's so many of us that have these stories that if Jesus hadn't got a hold of us, where would we have gone? Where would we have ended up? You know, so many of my friends, you know, Margo and I got married. She was 19 and I was 20 when we got married. And... When I used to come home from work and turn, we, we owned a house right on Maple Street across from that little chapel I was telling you about, just a few blocks from the little circle in downtown Orange. And as I would turn off on the Maple Street from the main street there, I could look and I could see all my buddies' cars that there was a place called O'Hara's Pub. And so that lifestyle for them just continued on, except for Paul Fox. I mean, Paul, Paul had gone through some really tough stuff and I was able to explain the gospel to him. And uh, Paul uh, started coming to church with us, and he was wonderfully saved, turned his life over to Jesus, still serves the Lord. He and his wife have always been active for these last 40 some years in the church. Paul really is the only other one that really came to the Lord. But all those guys were still drinking, and still, it just became such a lifestyle that it, alcohol had a book. When I went to my 10 year reunion, I looked around the room and I told Margo, I said, man, so many of these guys are, are purebred alcoholics already. And, it, it, and the, the liquor and the lifestyle and behavior just was such a norm. So I, I just know that that could have been me. Mm. And uh, so I'm just so grateful. And then I, I look from that day, those early days of our marriage, and we, we got involved with church right then. I mean, the first five years of our marriage, we were the youth directors at our church. And we had a youth director, of, I mean, a youth group of about 45 folks, 45 kids. And... Uh, you know, I, I was on that church board uh, because of that, you know, right off the bat. And I've been on a church board essentially from then until now. And just always been involved with church. It's become our life. And, uh, and it's, it, we just feel like it's about building the kingdom. And some of the lessons that we've learned, uh, particularly, uh, are, have to do with, with giving. And I, I, I'm not going to be able to share that with you tonight. But uh, Margo's dad... Is just he, he's the guy that early on he said you know Doug if if you just don't get, buy your furniture and your appliances on credit you'll have enough money to give to God and I remember driving along the freeway he was in the carpet business and we were going to pick up some carpet and he was just teaching things and I was just like a sponge you know I, I, anything he said about the kingdom I was in 
And then Reverend Hall, our pastor, came. He was a missionary in Africa for 20 years. And then he came on board about, uh, about a year and a half later and became really my lifelong mentor. He died now about seven years ago, passed away. But I've never known a guy like him. And he, he was uh, became the district superintendent for the Church of Nazarene down there in Southern California. And just a just a great influence on myself and my kids, and Daniel, and all, all my kids in Reverend Hall. And Reverend Farr, who many of you know from Bozeman, and the crazier most days. Uh, so we've just had some great mentoring and great influences in our life. But Reverend Hall and Howard taught us early on about our pocketbook and about what it means to be involved and be all in for Jesus. And they, they just told me stories about their own life and how you can't outgive God. And God says, try me, you know, test me and see if I won't just pour out a blessing to you that there won't be room enough to receive it. And I remember we, we were, uh, it was 1975, and uh, so I was 21 years old, Margot was 20, and we were having a, uh, a fundraiser. Well, before we ever got married, uh, we were having a fundraiser. We built a new church. I'm just going to share a couple of stories way on. I, I, I really am guarded with this because... You know, what, what really influenced me early on is we used to have preaching about giving, about trusting God, and about making giving a part of your lifestyle. We don't hear that anymore. The, you know, there, there's such a negative uh, spirit in the Christian world these days about what they have labeled prosperity giving, and uh, which I personally feel is a bunch of bunk. I am so grateful and so thankful that early on these giants in the church we're not bashful about telling you the rest of the story and the fact that, you know, do trust God, do get involved, you know, uh, get your checkbook out and, and get out on a limb and trust Jesus, you know. And, and so uh, we were having a fundraising drive back shortly after I came to, I'd probably been saved and in the, going to their church six or eight months. And we went on a Sunday morning and a Sunday night and they said, what would you pledge? And so I pledged, like uh, $600 in the morning, and then that night, we went back. In those days, we went to church twice on Sundays. And if you didn't, you were definitely going to hell. I swear it was. I never got used to that. I'm so glad the church got over it. Just saying. But uh, that night, that night, uh, afterwards, we were sitting in Margo's driveway, and um, Margo said, isn't that really neat how that one guy gave, like, because the guy was reading pledge cards, right? And he's, oh, here's somebody who gave 600 in the morning, and he's given $400 now. So that way, guys, up to $2,000. And so um, she just happened to say, isn't it neat how that one guy gave 600 in the morning and gave $400 at night? And I said, well, I wasn't going to say anything, but that was me. And, uh, and she will tell the story. She said, hey, we were out in the driveway, just totally in love with each other. And she had given, by the way, all of her savings, which was not a lot, because she was a waitress at the little snapshot there, but, but she had like two or three hundred bucks, and she gave it all that night. And uh, and she, she'll tell you that that was the night she knew she was looking at her future husband, because we were so much in alignment on something that is so key. Because that's a challenge when you don't agree on something like giving. Well, fast forward a couple years, and we're married now. Our new pastor had been there about a year. And we were going to build this prayer track. It was a $400,000 project. And myself and four other guys headed this project up from the different trades there and stuff like that. You know, we had some equipment that, you know, anyway, we, we, we just, uh, it was just a fun deal. But um, uh, I was with Reverend Hall and, the, and his wife and Margo's parents down in Long Beach. We used to go down there on Saturday nights for dinner. And it was one of those few times in my life that I felt God speaking to me. And, uh, uh, and I had, we just bought a house. We had it for a year. And those were the days when, when Orange County was just starting to run away. And the, the valuation was, was just going nuts. And I had paid $42,000 for this house. And a year later, it was worth $55,000. That same house today, by the way, is like four hundred and some thousand dollars yeah, it, it, I mean, it's a, it's a total deal down, a different deal down there nowadays. But, and I just felt like the Lord was telling me to sell that house. And uh, I, I remember being really quiet at dinner that night. And I went home, and about 11 o'clock at night, I called Reverend Hall. He's got a preacher in the morning. And I said, hey, Reverend Hall, i got to talk to you. And I said, 
He said, what's up? And I said, I, I feel like God's telling me to sell my house and give that money to the chapel project. And he said, well, let's talk about that. He said, what, what the Lord really wants to know is your willingness. And he said, will you get in with both feet and will you trust him? And he said, maybe there's some other things to do. He said, I don't have any money either. He just came back from Africa. He was a missionary for 20 years. He said, I have a friend in Africa that's going to loan me $20,000 for this, for this chapel project. And, uh, I mean, this guy was just a man of faith. They, they had nothing. He told me a story years ago when he was a pastor in Lone Pine, California, that when he went to that church, they were going to, they, they brought him in. They said, you know, we, like after two months, they said, we can't afford to pay you anymore. And he said, well, no, you're going to pay me because it's my wife and I am. We don't have any money. And you called us here to be your pastor. And they said, we don't have any money. He said, you write the check. And he said, that next Sunday, his wife sat in the back of the church and she put all of her money into the offering that day. And it inspired that church. They had nothing. They went home that day. She said, honey, we don't have anything to eat. Their cupboards were bare. But that very Sunday morning, somebody had shot a deer and brought, they brought the whole deer over. Somebody else had just harvested their garden. They brought they had all these beans, beans and lettuces and tomatoes and everything and they brought it over. Somebody else brought some bread over. But they, they never went hungry. The church was re-energized because of that act of faith of her, his wife sitting in the back of the church and dropping some money in the offering plate. And the people got all excited and said, wow, look at all the money we took in this week. And, and then, of course, he started preaching on giving and, and the rest is history. And then shortly thereafter, of course, he went to be missionaries. So Reverend Hall borrowed that $20,000 for this chapel project in the Santa Ana Church. And uh, in... I, he said, well, Doug, would you like to borrow any money? I said, yeah, count me in. I said, I said, um, I had a, I had a lack of faith. I didn't think I could pay back 20000 but I thought I could pay back 15000 So I borrowed 15000 and Reverend Hall borrowed 20000 I was 21 years old. Mark was uh, 20 years old. We had no idea how we were going to pay it back. And to this day, it just kind of, we just did it. We never missed it. We never missed those, but it was a faith lesson that, that is just in my Young experience, it was just priceless, you know, and I wouldn't trade those days for anything. And I am here to tell you today that, you know, when you give out of your lack, when you don't have it, it is way more fun and way more trusting and way more exciting in your faith walk than when you have a lot of money. You know, I've had it both ways. And um, we still get involved, but, you know, look, when we have stories, Similar to that, that we could tell you throughout our entire life, stuff where I, I'm saying, Lord, are you sure you want me to do that? You know, and, and yeah, okay, we'll do it. And so, you know, every time you kind of hold on a little too tightly, it's like he comes knocking on the door of your heart and says, hey, I got a project. I want you to give into it. Will you do it? And the answer is always going to be yes. He can have everything we've got. I mean, literally, if, if it was the right deal, and he came knocking, we'd sell our house, we'd sell everything we had. We, I mean, there was a deal at our last church that we attended that um, we didn't have any extra money freed up. And I went home and I said, I'm thinking maybe we should sell our house, honey. And she said, I'm thinking the same thing, you know. But we've just always been in alignment. So I just, I, I just wanted to tell you that part of our story, the giving thing to us is a huge part of our faith walk. It has been an experiment. We do test God to see what he will do. He says he, he will give it back to you, pressed down, shaking together, and running running over, right? And uh, so we live that way, and it's, it's an exciting way to live. And I say that, you know, there's some people here that, that are just always a cynic or two in the room. Um, when Jesus, when the, when the four parallel, the guys lowered the parallel up in, into that house, there were cynics in that room that day. They just found trouble with it. And I know not everybody understands the giving thing. I'm not saying to give to get. We give because we get to give. We don't give to get anything back. It's just that simple. But I know that there, if there was one person in this room tonight that wanted to step out on faith and start really trying on God in a serious way, then I'm willing to risk it because it's just been the, one of the greatest blessings of our life. And with that in mind, I want to just move into some scripture here. So for me... Uh, when there's a scripture in 1 John 4, 16, it says, we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. That's, the, of course, the Apostle John talking. That's the same Apostle that you remember, he talks about leaning on the chest 
of Jesus in that room. And he describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Jesus didn't love any, him any more than the rest of the disciples, but he understood the love that Jesus had for him maybe better than anybody. You know, he just understood. It's the same guy here now that says, we've come to know and believe the love that God has for us. And so it's one thing to know, it's another thing to believe. And so, you know, I, I want to come to a point where I, where I completely, 100% believe that he loves me. That's what I want to know. Because if, if I just know about him, but I don't, don't understand and truly believe the depth of his love for me, you know, then there's an opportunity to have almost a wasted gift. I mean, think about your wife for a second. And I know not everybody's married, but uh, anybody that you have a lot of affection and respect or you want to have a relationship with, think about it for a minute. If, if you've been with that person for a while and they don't know that you, they don't believe that you love them, it changes that relationship immensely. It's the difference between night and day. It's the difference between being a transformational type of love that changes life, that gives security, that gives peace of mind, that gives that gives self-esteem and value and worth. Because if I if I've given my wife doubts, you know, that does he love me? I wonder if God loves me. I don't want my wife to ever have that thought. So I have to I have to do something. I have to my my actions, by my actions, I have to demonstrate that I love her. And by Christ's actions, he demonstrates continually that he loves us. So we're gonna read a couple of scriptures here in a second. But it, it's our actions will determine whether somebody can know and believe that you love them. And uh, to me it's it's a big deal. And and love that Love that exists and is coming in a new direction, but it's not believed, is love wasted. It's, it's love that gets right to your doorstep, but it doesn't get in because you're not receiving it, right? Or, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe you're giving love. Maybe there's outflow coming from you, but if somebody doesn't know that and they can't receive it, or maybe your walls are up or their walls are up, and there's all this love, there's enough love to, to change somebody's life forever, that if it can't penetrate the walls of your heart or if your guard's up, that love can be wasted. So that's some of the stuff that I'd like to talk about at your table here in a few minutes. So, so what is the evidence or lack of evidence in, uh, in the relationship that, that we're talking about here? So we don't want to live in subpar relationships. We don't want to live in substandard relationships. Why would anybody go to an altar? You probably heard me say this before and say, you know, all your vows and stuff and say, you know, I'm counting on mediocrity in this, in this relationship, you know. I mean, no bride would want to hear that at a wedding day because you want excellence. You want the very best. And yet, if we're not open in our relationship, if we're not convincing, you know, we could, we could, uh, we could have some problems. So is my wife secure, you know? Is, is, am I laying down tracks? Is there evidence of my love for her? So that she truly knows that I love love her and she believes me. So like with Jesus, you know, he he's, he's he, from the beginning of time, there has been a plan for our redemption and to walk with him and to be elevated and adopted and to, uh, it says, for as he is, so are we in this world. And uh, and we are, we're going to spend eternity with him, you know, just right next to Jesus, because that's the plan, because he, because, he gets, because he loves us. And so love that's demonstrated, like Jesus, love for us, it's experiential. And when, when you experience the love of somebody else, nobody can take that away from you. And so like when I experience the love of God, you know, that becomes my testimony. Early Those early days of my life, when I was moving away from a life of carnality and poor choices and bad behavior and just basically self selfish living, you know, into a new trajectory of a faith walk and yielding to him, those are really some of the best days of my life because I, I was such a difference. It was just like the difference between night and day. And those experiences you can't take away from, from me. You know, my wife Margot, she like now I have a, I'll give you a couple examples. She I have a CPAP machine. Me and Randy and some of the guys and we we're we're manly men because we have to have CPAP machines. And, uh, you know, it just if you sleep too sound, your heart 
beats really slow, and then it has to work harder to make up for it. Well, there's a tube and there's stuff. Well, you know, every day Margo gets that thing out and she washes it up for me. And I see her in there. It could be six in the morning or seven in the morning. I see her doing that. I see her doing our laundry. I see her just doing things. You know, when I left tonight, she said, who's speaking tonight? And I said, well, tonight I do the short straw. As I leave the door, she goes, I know you're going to do a great job. But she's just always affirming. You know, she just lifts me up. And uh, I know she idolizes me in a good kind of way. You know, I, I just don't have any doubt. And that's what I want for her, too. I want her to know that I idolize her. Not more than my relationship with Jesus or for her. But we just have to have that kind of relationship. So, and so love demonstrated by our actions, you know, is transformational. It changes lives. It builds up trust and hope. Uh, it, it provides uh, security. I, I just identified four things that, ha that uh, have to do with with this love thing. And I, I would, I, I'm calling it giving and serving on the one hand. And I'm calling, and the other side of it is gratitude and receiving. So, you know, giving and serving are, are very synonymous, very similar, but not the same. The dictionary says that to give is to grant or to confer something to somebody. It's a gift. Whereas ser serving is actually an act of service. So if Jesus washes the disciples' feet, it's, it's a gift, and yet he's really serving, right? And uh, so I, I think the, the point, though, is that these outflows of giving and serving, unless they are absorbed and received, they could be wasted. Again, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. Well, he's, he's knocking with his toolkit of love and mercy and comfort. You know, he, he just wants to pour into us. But we've got to we've got to let him in, and if we will let him in, then we get into that experiential mode of, of actually experiencing the love of God, right? And so that's the piece that nobody can ever take away from from us because we've felt it, we've experienced it, we've, and sometimes you hear his voice, uh, maybe not literally, but you know when he's talking to you, and that kind of love, that kind of experience. Now he healed me. Many of you know this. I, I had double vision for. For almost three weeks, two days short of three weeks. This was just within the last month. My eyesight went bad on the 8th of October. I was in Denver for three days each day. got progressively worse. That clock on the wall, if I were to look at it, there would be another clock about six feet below it. Every set of taillights, every stop sign, every all of these lights here would be like a kaleidoscope. And the doctor, they checked me for a brain tumor with an MRI, and they sent me back again for a CAT scan, angiogram with the blood, you know, through the through the brain and everything, so they could really get a clear look. Said it, it could go away in 90 days. I was clear on all the, all the stuff. And uh, we started praying for my daughter, Haley, because she's had some pregnancy, trying to get pregnant, and we took it serious as a family. And I texted everybody, there, there's four kids, all married, so there's eight of them, and Margaret and I, there's 10 adults. I said, let's pray and fast every Thursday, if that works for you, and let's get serious. In other words, let's just don't say, hey, Jesus, if it be your will, please, okay. Let's Sacrifice. Let's get on to it. They all they all agreed to it. And that first Thursday, uh, that afternoon, I remember going in the room and just just getting down on my knees, which was just a just a fun, awesome experience. You know, just just with nobody around. Margo was bad cough, bronchitis, and she's upstairs praying in in uh, another room. And and uh, anyway, I don't want to belabor it, but next morning. For the first time in, in almost three weeks, my eyes, I noticed that everything was clear. And I really wasn't praying for myself. I was praying for Haley. And um, and then uh, uh, 20 minutes later, it was clear. And then I looked outside. I could see far away. You know, the doctor, he said, man, that is a miracle. He said, that's crazy. He said, he, he said 90 days. Um, and then if that, if it doesn't come back, then, you know, solid city for surgery. And that's iffy. But he said, we, if that doesn't work, we can do corrective lenses. We can bring your eyes back together somehow. But uh, I come back and I said, hey, I told my whole story about my daughter and the fasting. And everything. He said, that's a great, that's a great story. And uh, from then till now, I have, you know, I've got 2015 vision. Better now than I've had in high school. So I'm taking that. I wouldn't trade that that time in the two and a half weeks for anything that I've ever been in, involved with. It's just pretty good stuff. My point in all that is just simply that I know and I believe, like John said, I believe that God loves me. 
because he demonstrates that love by his actions. And that's what I wanted to kind of wrap up with tonight. The, uh, the, Daniel, if you could put up there the slide on Romans 8, if you have that. Um, and not that per se, but, but that commentary. Did you get that? If not, I'll just read it. Just read it. Okay, I'm just going to read this one. And then if you can get Psalms 103 ready, if you have that. This is a commentary. You, you, you may have heard this before, you know, that uh, what can separate us from the love of God, right? I mean, there's nothing that can separate us from his love. But the way this commentator says, uh, what we should conclude from all this, we, as children of God, we have been adopted into his family. We're co-heirs with Christ. We have received this, uh, yeah, that's it, if you can read it. Uh, we are co-heirs with Christ. We have received the Spirit as the guarantee of final redemption. Our prayers are taken up by the Spirit and laid before God. Though sinners by nature, through faith, we have been acquitted of all wrong. Our future glorification is so certain that God speaks of it as if it has already taken place. Certainly, if God is for us, what does it matter that, who, that anybody could be against us? Since he didn't spare his own son, but delivered him over to death for us all, will he not, along with this gracious gift, also lavish upon us everything else he has to give? And so he goes on with this argument, like, God is so good to us. He's done this, 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 and this for us. Guess what? He actually loves us. He demonstrated it for us. He has this plan. He's already justified us, which means that he declares us righteous, even in, with the faults and the blemishes that we have. And there's no condemnation. He's already forgotten our sin. He loves us. He's got a plan for us. What do we do? We either open that door and let him in and let that love come into the receiving part of this exchange, or we keep the door shut. It's just that simple. It, um, the psalmist says it this way in Psalm 103. He says, bless the Lord. Oh, he says, uh, verse 2. Okay, that'll work. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is with me, within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And now here's the itemization, the way David looked at it. David just understood his love. Uh, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all of our iniquities, who heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. By the way, he took care of Moses and all the acts for the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide you, nor will he keep his anger forever. He forgets things quickly. He does not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. In other words, that's enough, you know. Bottom line is he loves us. Will we receive it? That's really the question. Will we receive it? Now, finally, Daniel, if you could... Hopefully, get this one up on a, just a little exercise on the, what, what's called the five languages of love. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Gary Chapman, and we can kind of go through this together, and then I'll be done, and and, and uh, we can just kind of wrap up. But words of affirmation, you, um, using words to build up the other person. Example: Thanks for taking out the garbage. Uh, not it's about time you took the garbage out, you know, the, the flies are going to carry it out for you. Uh, words of affirmation, that's number one. Next. Gifts. You know, uh, gifts are a language of love, is what he says. A gift says, he was thinking about me, look what he got for me. And let's go to the next one. Acts of service. Again, this is uh, uh, a Christian psychologist and counselor. Doing something for your spouse that you know they would like. Cooking a meal, washing dishes. Vacuuming floors. Vacuuming floors are all acts of service. So there's just a few examples here. The fourth one is quality time. Giving your wife quality time. Uh, in other words, and he goes on to say here that if you're, if you're Love, if your wife's or if your wife's love language is quality time, giving them your undivided attention is one of the best ways you can show your love. 
And then finally, physical touch, uh, holding hands, hugging, kissing, etc. You know, Margaret and I, we never take one step away from our car, into a restaurant, away from church, wherever we go. We don't take one step without holding hands. If I walk more than five steps without her hand in mine, something doesn't feel right. You know, and not, maybe that's not for everybody. It's just what we've done for the last 40-some years. But but the, uh, Dr. Dobson used to say that women respond to touch, where men are physically uh, attracted to the uh, opposite sex by eyesight, where women are motivated by touch. And so much more than with my wife or your lover would it make sense to be putting your hands on her uh, shoulders or holding her hand, giving her a hug. We can do better at all that. So I'm just going to cut it off real quick right there. We, and take 10 or 15 minutes. And I just want you to ask, ask the question, you know, what can I do to affirm somebody in that I encounter? doesn't have to be a lover, but... What can, how can I do a better job of affirming this person, right? And, and, and then you can talk about, you know, giving uh, quality of uh, time and some of the other things that are on there. But let's just start with affirmation. And, but, that, but that's my story. And I, I just want to encourage you tonight to recognize the fact that God loves you so much. He's got your, he's got your life mapped out for you. But if you're like I was years ago, and you're holding on to things, and you're delaying and delaying and deferring that decision, I just ask that you would give God time and attention to completely yield yourself to Him, and just try try Him on in all of His fullness, so that you can, like John said, come to a point where you know and believe His love, not just as an abstract thing that's out there but that you can experience his love. And it all starts with just one step. So we got 10 or 15, and after we're done, we'll, we'll ask five or six to help clean up. Thanks. Yeah.